Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Bitter, and today I am bringing you a solo episode. In this episode, we are going to dive into a variety of topics around the mental and psychological aspect of running, and then kind of weave in how maybe that plays in with staying consistent and motivated throughout your training and racing. I tried to kind of break it into sort of a couple of categories. One is just like the training side of it, which, you know, makes up the bulk of the running or training you're going to do for any, any sport. And then the race side of it, the actual competition, the point where you're trying to kind of test all that work you did in the training and how that maybe plays into that. So this is going to be a little bit more of a mental, a mental podcast, I guess you could say, uh, before we get rolling into those and, and those topics were all listener submitted topics and questions. So I thank those of you who responded to my social media calls or reached out via email to send those submissions. in. I thought they kind of all combined for a really good topic to do this episode on, uh, Coming up, I also have another solo episode in the books right now that uh, I'll be releasing later this week, likely, that sort of is more of a low carb episode. It was a lot of questions that I received from my last call that had to do with low carbohydrate endurance. So I go over through, I think there's maybe four specific questions or topics within that kind of topic area that I hit on with that one. So if you're interested in that side of this show, uh, stay tuned. That one will be coming out shortly. Also in the hopper over on the show Patreon page is my interview with Evan DeMarco and Jana Breslin. So those two run a company called Complete Human, and they've both been very active in the health and fitness sphere for quite some time now for a variety of different things. Uh, Jana has been competitive in a lot of different things from bodybuilding uh, to modeling and all sorts of different stuff within the health and fitness sphere. You know, Evan's an entrepreneur and has done a lot of stuff along the lines of like cold, um, cryotherapy and things like that. And right now, one of the big topics that they're tackling or adding to that complete human philosophy that they have over there is regenerative agriculture. So for those of you who've listened to the show for quite some time, you will remember, we've done a few deep dives into regenerative agriculture in the past. Uh, I've had on some of the kind of big names in that world, like Alan Savory, Joel Salatin, Bobby Gills, and Will Harris from White Oak Pastures. So it has been a topic that has been covered a few times in the past here, a little bit different than maybe some of the typical shows, but one that I'm very much interested in still. And when opportunities come to talk to folks who are kind of in that world, I'm going to take them. And this particular one was different from those previous interviews because those previous ones were folks were very much into that world and had been for quite some time and were a little more traditional, I would say. They kind of came with kind of a farming background or an agriculture background. And one of the reasons I found Evan and Jana's specific approach or situation interesting was because when I had Bobby Gill on a while ago, he mentioned that what will maybe really be helpful to kind of spur regenerative agriculture as a more common practice or drive the demand for it more would be people who are kind of coming from different areas and inject some youth into the movement, so to speak, because as we look at just agriculture and ranching and farming in general, it's somewhat of an aging occupation. So regenerative agriculture is uh, looking to kind of inject some youth into that. And with that, bring some notoriety and consumer based demand around that style of agriculture. Uh, so that was a fun one. We talked about some other stuff too, like the stuff that Evan and Jana have done outside of just the regenerative agriculture that fits into their complete human approach and some of the things they're up to along the way with that too. So those, those episodes are all up on the show Patreon page right now. If you want to support the show and get access to those early before they're released to the public and ad free, those are some great spots to go for that. Uh, for as little as $1 per month, you can get the ad-free episode when it releases everywhere, or for $3 per month, you can get early release plus ad-free as well. So if you're looking to support the show and want to get your hands on those episodes early and get straight to the topic, great spot to do it is a show Patreon page. You can find the link to that at zachbitter.com forward slash HPO. Also at 
zachbitter.com forward slash HPO is the links and details to all the previous shows, as well as ways you can donate if you want to support the show monetarily, but not through Patreon. There's some easy one-click uh, direct donation links there as well. If you don't want to support the show monetarily, but do want to help it grow, it goes a long ways to like, share, subscribe episodes on your favorite podcast platform. So please do that with your friends and family when you find an episode that you really find useful. Uh, also, another way to help support the show is through the show sponsors, which can all be found at zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Gooder. Gooder makes $25 active sunglasses for anyone. Gooder sunglasses are lightweight, comfortable, don't move when you move, all for only $25. No slip, no bounce, all polarized and all fun. All Gooders are 100% UV protective and 100% polarized. Whether you are running, cycling, hiking, or simply spending some time in the sun, Gooder will stay snug and comfy. Gooder is running free U.S. shipping on all orders over $50 a 30-day free return, one-year warranty, 100% carbon neutral, and 1% for the planet. So go to gooder.com, that's G-O-O-D-R.com forward slash HPO to get 15% off your entire order when you use the code HPO at checkout. Links for that will be in the show notes as well as at zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. This episode sponsor is Element. Element makes an electrolyte supplement with no sugar. Each packet is loaded with 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. They come in convenient single serve packets that make them great for bringing along for a run, hike, going to the gym, or while traveling. My go to's are the citrus flavor and the newly restocked watermelon flavor for my long runs and post-run rehydration, as well as their chocolate flavor, which I love to add in my morning coffee with a little bit of creamer. Tastes great, and it's a fun way to start the day for me. If you are hesitant or would like to try out Element first, before you purchase, they are offering a flavor sample pack with one of each of their flavors for free to anyone who uses the HPO URL. If you want to check them out and support HPO along the way, you can head over to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO. That's drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO. Links can be found in the show notes as well as at zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. And today I'm coming to you solo with a topic theme or some questions that I kind of lumped together that I felt kind of worked well together or mixed well. And it kind of has to do with like the mental psychological aspect with running as well as like consistency, which I think has a big place within the mental side, or at least the planning side of programming your training and racing schedule so that you are able to kind of complete what you're trying to get after and be realistic with yourself. And we'll layer in some other things too, like what can you be doing with your physical training in preparation for a race that will also prepare you to be able to mentally get over some of those hard spots during an event, whether you're racing kind of shorter Olympic distance events or ultra marathon type distances. All right. So one of the questions that kind of came in was more around that mental psychological aspect of running. And it was like, what are your thoughts on the psychological game of running and having a plan? So I really like this question because I think it puts you in a position to maybe think about just not only what you're doing in training and think about why you're doing it, as well as using those as opportunities to prepare your mind for your race itself. So for those of you who've done an endurance event, one of the really interesting things about it, and this happens regardless of the distance, you ultimately get to a spot in that race or that event where you start questioning yourself or asking yourself, can I do this? Or can I sustain this pace or effort? Or do I need to slow down? That kind of first seed of doubt is planted after those nerves kind of vanish away at the beginning of the start of the race. And it's that kind of first spot where you start kind of having to battle your mind a little bit and 
for those of you who've done a lot of events, you'll probably remember at least some where you felt like when those little like questions came up, you were able to like snap into it and blow right through them. You were able to refocus, answer that question, trust the process and keep pushing. And then there's, there's just some days where you seem to be able to do that more readily or more consistently. And then there's the, the, the other side of that spectrum where you kind of get hit early with those or they become insurmountable sooner than they normally would. And you just aren't able to push through as many of them. And there's a variety of reasons for that. It can be things as simple as you know, you're just too aggressive in your racing strategy based on where your fitness was currently at. Or it could just be, you know, you had a lot of other stress in your life or things that were, uh, you know, also kind of clouding in your mind, your ability to stay focused and just determined on that one singular goal. So what I like to do with this sort of thing is keeping that in my mind when I'm planning my schedule, as well as when I'm executing a run or a workout. So since being able to kind of push through those is partly just repetition or practice doing it, using your workouts to focus on those points and think about, okay, here's an opportunity to practice when this will come up on race day. And the reason why I think this is important is because race days are very few and far between in most cases relative to the amount of, especially relative to the amount of days that you're going to be out there running, just training and preparing for them. So anytime you can find an opportunity to work on your mental game on a race day setting in the training, the better prepared you're going to be able to tackle that side of the equation when you're out there racing. So one of my best examples of this is actually like using kind of your long run for for the race you're going to do. And the reason I use this one, because this is the one that tends to be a little more specific to me. So I've got some more reflection points on it, but when I'm preparing for a hundred mile race, usually near the end of that plan, I'll be in a position where I'm really developing my long run or my back-to-back -back long runs. And that might mean on Saturdays and Sundays, I'm going out and running you know, quite a bit, maybe three, four, and five hours in a session. And during those times, there is opportunity to maybe get a little bored, maybe ask, is this really worth spending this much time training? Is it really going to make a big difference if I'm kind of pushing through any type of like discomfort and things like that? And I try to use that as an opportunity to not only recognize those spots that might come up in a race and find ways that are going to personally for me, help me navigate that or recognize when they're actually like signs that I should be stopping for long-term health and preser preservation versus just kind of a, a moment of mental weakness. So one way that uh, I like to kind of go into the, to the, to the workout to make sure I'm in a position to practice that is the use of visualization. So let's say I'm doing like a 30 mile long run. So a pretty long, long run in the grand scheme of things. And I'm preparing for a hundred mile race during that 30 mile long run. I'm going to be imagining that entire time that I'm at 70 miles of the hundred mile race that I'm doing. And I'm just going to visualize what it's like to move through that final 30 miles. And that might be as simple as uh, picking like a, a, a starting point of like, let's get to mile five first and uh, work on just like what it's going to feel like and what it's going to be like to kind of comprehend the fact that I have 75 miles in my legs when I get to that point, And then I need to move on to the next step and tackle the next 25 and find just little spots that make sense in my mind to kind of fixate on. So then when I get into the race itself, rather than trying to pull from my experiences, the last time I ran hundred miles, I'm able to pull from the experiences that I did multiple times during the long runs and use those as motivation and, and sometimes just convincing. Because a lot of the times, if you've did the training, if you trust the process that you built up with, it's more of just being able to convince yourself in the moment that you are in position to do what you're trying to do. So when you have close proximity relations of your mind navigating that, it's just going to be a little more fruitful on race day. You can scale this away from ultra marathon and into the more, more standard endurance events too. And you really, what I like to think about first is which workouts are going to be the most specific to the race intensity that you're doing so that you're making it as similar physiologically the way you're going to feel on race day in that training session, when you're also working on those mental aspects. So if you're doing something a little shorter, like a three K or five K, it might be some short interval sessions where you think to yourself, like, okay, I'm going to do these 
10 repetitions of say two minutes or three minutes. Uh, and then thinking about like, as you're doing those, like putting yourself in a position where you're visualizing yourself through that distance. So you're visualizing, visualizing yourself as to where you would be in say a 5k during that workout and kind of chipping it off one and by one. And what I think that really helps you do is compartmentalize small chunks. So mentally or psychologically, it's going to be a lot easier for you, whether you're running a shorter endurance event or a longer endurance event to break it into chunks. So if in practice, you're doing that as well, and you're working on that mindset side of it, of, uh, I'm just going to worry about this interval right now, and I'm going to execute it as properly as I can. And I will think about that next one. Once I get to it, that type of practice mentally is going to help you in a race, say you're doing a 5k and at two kilometers, you start questioning whether you can continue at that intensity for three more kilometers. It's going to be a lot easier for your brain to kind of snap towards let's just get to through this third kilometer next before I start worrying about what's going to happen in the fourth and fifth ones. So that's kind of the way I like to kind of layer it in and to really kind of be thinking about how can I mentally practice and prepare for a race stay the same way I'm physically practicing for it too. Uh, next one is kind of along the motivation and consistent standpoint, which I think at least partly goes into the mental side because finding ways to stay motivated and consistent is kind of the mental preparation or the planning process of putting together a plan. So when it comes to staying motivated and consistent, I think there's kind of two major things to think about. The consistency side of this question is just being reasonable with yourself. So you're an individual and your lifestyle is going to be at least somewhat unique to anyone else who's training for the race you're training for or running in general. So one of the biggest mistakes I oftentimes see runners do is they decide to get excited about an event, to dial things in and prepare, and they are going to leverage the community, which is a great idea. The community of runners and group runs and things like that. Clubs can be great opportunities to stay consistent and stay motivated and add a little extra excitement or extra value into your training versus just doing everything by yourself. But you do have to be careful not to overly rely on other people's specific goals, uh, current state of fitness, their schedule, and try to like parrot that so much so that you get yourself into a situation where you're no longer doing things that are sustainable long-term that are going to keep you from being consistent. So really what you want to think about is you have a unique set of stressors in your life. You have a unique schedule that you have to navigate. You have a specific amount of time available to train if you realistically look at your schedule. And starting from there before planning what you're going to do is often the best spot to start. And if you do that and you give yourself the flexibility to plan within what you can actually sustain, you're going to be much more likely to be consistent with it. So a big example of a big mistake here is someone gets super motivated early on. They have a really busy schedule and they decide, okay, I'm going to try to do this, this 13 hour per week training plan or this 12 hour per week training plan. And realistically, they only have time for probably eight to 10 hours of training. So they might be able to kind of force it, sleep a little less, do a few things, neglect a few things along the way and get that 12, 13 hours of running in for a few weeks, but eventually that's probably going to catch up with them. Something's going to give, or at the very least, they're going to introduce stressors into their life that are unnecessary because they're trying to jam too much into a small window. Uh, that person would be much better off backing up and saying, okay, this is what I have available to me that I can do and still manage the stressors that I have for my other areas of life, as well as make sure I'm taking care of the big component of training which is recovery, which is going to be heavily reliant on sleep without, you know, not sacrificing that in the effort to get in some arbitrary number of training hours per week, they're going to likely be much more consistent throughout the course of that plan and maybe multiple plans. And then over the time that they are able to continue to do that, continue to be consistent, continue to be injury free, continue to recover quicker because they're respecting their stressors from other areas and getting the right amount of sleep they're going to be much more likely to outperform themselves going that other route. That is going to be a little more kind of peak and valley ish. They might get some good training blocks in, but then they might burn out or run out of time and then bail out at weeks at a time. So that's really like the way I like to look at that is in order to stay consistent, you need to be honest with yourself with what you have. 
there's a lot of different strategies that you can use to prepare for a race from either a lower volume to a higher volume framework. So you're not out of luck if you're someone who just doesn't have a lot of time to give, you can still participate in the sport and do it at a pretty high level for yourself. Uh, if you kind of go in with the expectations being acknowledged as to what, I'm, what your opportunity from a time standpoint is, and then structuring your plan in a way that's going to be the most beneficial for that block of time versus somebody else. The next part is staying motivated. So this is another good one. I think staying motivated is oftentimes kind of coincides with the consistency piece, because if you're consistent, I find you're going to probably be more likely to be motivated. You're not going to have these situations where you feel like you're on top of the world because you executed an unsustainable plan for two weeks, but then all of a sudden didn't run for the entire third week something like that. Those are all things that I think stunt or block motivation that, that can continue. Uh, so starting with consistency, then moving to motivation is usually the order of operations that I prefer. Uh, but once you get to that point, what I like to do from a motivation standpoint is picking an event is a great starting point. That's going to get you excited. It's going to give you a target. It's going to be something to plan around. It's going to allow you to sit down and structure what you want to do between the day you start and the day you do the event. And that is going to give you a lot of upfront motivation. Those first few weeks, you're probably going to be able to feed right off of that. And you're just going to be hyper-focused. You're going to be excited about it. You have this structure in your life built around this plan that you put together and things like that. Oftentimes though, what I see with folks who only go in with that motivator is they find finally get to a spot in the plan where they hit a roadblock for motivation where that excitement about the event has slightly waned. Maybe they got busier at work or had something in life happen that made it a little more difficult to kind of stay on schedule. And it just gets a little more difficult to get up and do that workout or to push, you know, or to stay on that schedule versus you know, giving yourself a little bit of liberties for some extra rest days that you don't technically need because your motivation is lacking versus your body actually needing the rest and recovery. So things that I like to do to kind of void that a bit is rather than just focusing on the end product or the event itself, think about the entire package that you're going to do throughout the course of a plan. So let's say you're doing a plan that is somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 to 24 weeks long before a race. And there is going to be different phases of that plan. In most cases, you're going to have what a, a periodized plan where you're during, you're focusing primarily on certain aspects and those are going to kind of ebb and flow and phase in and phase out throughout your plan, depending on what distance you're doing and what intensity you're planning on racing it. So that gives you the opportunity to really block the plan into chunks versus a whole big 16 to 24 week process. And if you look at that kind of carefully, you can see some, some spots in there that are kind of good target points to maybe focus on to kind of keep motivation high that give you some built-in rewards. It'll make you excited to go out and do that next workout versus feeling like, why am I doing this for the fourth time? Why am I doing this for the fifth time? And that sort of a mentality that you can kind of get to if you don't have a very specific direction with it, that isn't a race that could be weeks, if not months out. So here's some examples of how to do that. A lot of times the programs that I put together, they'll have some combination of short intervals, long intervals and tempo runs, long run development, some base foundational work where we're working kind of the high end of the easy pace or like your aerobic threshold, there'll be easy runs. And then if the race intensity is touching on a intensity that's different from the ones I described, oftentimes there'll be some workouts that are focused specifically on race intensity. Uh, they're all going to be kind of broken up and structured differently, but ultimately you can take each one of those and use those as measuring sticks to gauge progress. So let's take short intervals. For example, if you're doing short intervals as a kind of primary focus in your training, one thing to stay motivated is it's just to focus on that versus your race goal or thinking about, you know, getting to the finish line. Think about, okay, here is the starting point at which I'm doing these short intervals. If I keep the intensity appropriate and similar from one workout to the next, you should see improvement in your pace on that if you're training properly. So looking forward to those workouts as is, am I going to make a fitness breakthrough where now the intensity I provided three or four weeks ago is going to produce a faster pace, or is the heart rate that I produced three or four weeks ago going to produce a faster pace at this intensity? These are great things you can build into your plan. You can do that from your easy runs to your base runs that are getting up to like your aerobic threshold, your marathon paced runs. If you're doing a marathon, 
your long intervals or tempo runs, or even your, your uh, long run development, you may get to a point when you're developing that where even with adding some additional volume to it, you might find, hey, my pace is actually improving at this same heart rate or same intensity, which are great motivators and great things that I think are going to keep you excited to go out to the next one. When you see those wins and you kind of check those boxes of, yep, I'm heading in the right direction, and you're able to do that frequently enough versus having to wait you know, months, if not half a year to really get that reward, I think you put yourself in a much better position to be consistent throughout that plan itself. All right. Finally, last question is what is the hardest thing for you to be consistent with? This is a good question. So I would say like historically, one of my biggest blessings could somewhat have been a little bit of a curse too, where uh, historically I've been very, very injury resistant, meaning that I haven't really had to deal with a whole lot of injury issues. So some of the stuff that can typically be useful for injury prevention are the things that I would maybe historically be more likely to avoid doing, or maybe skip more often, or at least not be as consistent with. And, uh, you know, sometimes you like, I'll get reminders of that. So like in 2017, I had my first real significant injury while, while ultra marathon running, and I had to take about seven weeks off. So through that process, I didn't have the opportunity to run. So I used that time to like, kind of look into, well, where are some of my strengths and weaknesses just physically that I had been ignoring or neglecting because they didn't really surface in a big, meaningful way until I hurt myself and finding out what those were and then working on those and then recognizing, Hey, if I can be consistent with these, when my body feels healthy, I'm unlikely to find myself in a situation where I break down to the point of getting injured too. So this is something where I've gotten a lot more consistent with, especially in the last year, because uh, similar to 2017, I've kind of been currently dealing with a little bit of an issue. So uh, specifically my right ankle, uh, and that kind of led to a little bit of like left knee issues over the last few months. So I'm kind of in the process of working on that and finding like, what do I need to be doing to make sure those areas of my body stay resilient and able to tolerate the training I want to put through it in order to maximize my races. And how is that going to phase in once I start getting to the point where I'm able to train? So to kind of sum that up, I really do enjoy the process of running. That is the, the thing I would like to be doing and oftentimes would like to be doing more of. And I don't have a lot of trouble getting motivated to do that. But there is probably almost certainly for everyone a diminishing a margin diminishing returns there where you're trying to do so much like running and maybe other stuff where you start neglecting the things that are going to allow you to kind of do what you know has worked historically. So for me, kind of those supplementary activities can sometimes be things that I have to kind of be a little more strict with myself on versus just being excited and feeling grateful that I'm able to do it. All right, folks. So that is uh, the topics on mental, psychological uh, motivation, and then a little personal example for myself with consistency and what I struggled with historically the most and kind of have to keep an eye on. Uh, if you have other questions that you'd like to hit on, me to hit on or topics, feel free to reach out to me on either social media at Zach Bitter on Instagram or at ZBitter on Twitter. Facebook is at ZBitter Endurance or shoot me an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. All those links will be in the show notes. Happy to cover any topics or questions you might have that would be find useful for this podcast. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that this episode's sponsors are my friends at Element and Gooder Sunglasses. Element makes a great electrolyte supplement and right now they are giving away a free sample pack that's one of each of their flavors. Gooder is giving you 15% off your orders with your promo code HPO. Head to the show notes or to zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors for links, details, and discount options. All right, that does it. So if you enjoyed this episode, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing to it and letting your friends and families know who you think may also benefit from it. That helps me grow the episode and ultimately release more podcast episodes. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, folks, if you are interested in adding some structure to your training program, I have some options that might interest you. 
Over on my website, ZachBitter.com, I have a wide range of ready-made plans that have options for beginners to advanced endurance athletes. I also have personalized plan options where I will cater a plan specific to the event you are preparing for and your personal schedule and training availability. You can also access a variety of add-on options from email collaboration to consultation calls to help guide you through your training and nutrition needs. You can access these with or without a formal plan. So head over to ZachBitter.com and let me know what you think.